What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to Basement Side. I'm your host, Greg, also known as Deeg, here with Matt and Taylor. Hello, gentlemen. Hi. Hello. So, uh, what's going on in the basement this week? <laughs> Go. <laughs> Whips. You guys are my contact. Tied up. <laughs> Just lots of uh what's my there, child like, found my sex dungeon yeah well no damn that beats what i've been up to i've been playing diabolical <laughs> in the basement with the sex dungeon right around the corner <laughs> sex games huh well, let me tell you about this video game yeah <laughs> it's diabolical it's kinkiest move i've ever heard of yeah diabolical's fun i like it um, it's a good answer to Quake Champions, which I don't, is it ever going to get out of early access? Who knows? I don't know if it's really an answer to Quake Champions, though, because I think it started development well before, since it's developed by like one and a half people. Well, I mean, years? answer in the sense the of it's, it's the only game to play that's like Quake now or just regular old deathmatch, isn't it? What else is yeah. there? That's about I mean, it. It's more Quake than Quake Champions. Away or died. So what is Diabotical, for those who don't know what it is? I'll take a stab. Diabotical is the latest in a long, torturous series of attempts to recapture and rebottle the magic that is Quake Deathmatch. Quake, which is a skills-based first-person shooter. You play against and with your friends, pick up rocket launchers and rail guns, and you shoot them, and whoever has the best shooter has the biggest dick. Right, and Diabotical is basically a children's version of that where you're a little cartoon character balls that bounce around and frolic. Yeah, egg But box. the fact that your cartoon character balls are part of what I think makes it so great is it brings back the even playing field. There's no yeah. more. You can, you can customize them so you have all this goofy shit on your face and whatnot, but in the grand scheme, it doesn't matter. Because it's very pure. Yeah, everyone's the ball. Everyone has the same weapons. Everyone has the same speed. Everyone has the same health. And that's what I've been missing. Right. It's a very balanced game. But you love TFC, which is not that. It's, TFC is still balanced, but it's also built around offense versus defense. And abilities. I mean, lightly, yeah. <laughs> but still, you are you have an objective in that game. You're defending a flag in a base. You're a, a team of four or five on defense, and then there's a team of four or five on offense. Whereas yeah. this is just deathmatch shooting each other. It it is nice, like the level playing field of it is cool. Cause like I, I mean, I played a lot of Quake Three back in the day, and like one of the things that was always really annoying was playing as Orb, or if anybody was playing as Orb, rather, he's like <laughs> the eyeball guy. Like he was always like the hardest one to hit. Um, the odd job of Quake. Yeah, he's the odd job. Yeah, of, of Goldeneye or of Quake. Uh, and it was it was always like really annoying but this like everybody is the same and i think what's interesting too is like it's very contrasty in a way where like with quake champion sometimes it was really hard to tell like what who you were shooting at and what team they were on um just because it was like overly stylized whereas this game is just completely pure and basic right that was the first thing i noticed <clears throat> in our uh, quake champions they i don't know if photo real would be the description but the textures of the worlds look they look good they don't look bad at all it they match the trend of where most games are going but diabolical is a cartoon and your teammates are always blue the enemies are always yellow and those colors are not found anywhere in the maps that i've seen so far so they always stand out which is how it's supposed to be and i think that's a big thing that games have lost nowadays yeah. yeah, it's very yeah. competitively tuned, very deliberately done. Everything that I've seen about it, they're making ch very deliberate choices there, um, down to the player models, which are the same for everybody, which which is a big a big pointer towards saying we're trying to be a serious competitive game. And also to your guys' point about not having hero-style abilities, which is a big retort to Quake Champions, which that was their take on the Quake formula, is... The way to bring Quake to the masses is to make Quake for with Overwatch. Add heroes, add abilities, add I win buttons, which is, I know, one of your favorite things, Taylor. Right. And I think someone mentioned it today. It might have been you. I never really thought about it. But Quake Champions did just say, hey, let's copy Overwatch. But they didn't copy the part of Overwatch that makes that work. Well, there's, there's not 
I mean, they later came out with a couple of game modes, but I think it was way too late and no one played them. But there's no objectives in Quake Champions for those abilities to matter. Right. Mm -hmm. It's still basic DM in a nutshell. With the, I mean, yes, there's CTF, and yes, there was that. What the hell was the one called? Death, Slipgate. Deathgate. Slipgate. Yeah, Slipgate. That's what it was. Um, and Sacrifice. Yeah, both of those. But like nobody really played those. Right. Yeah, they, they came out really late. After the game yeah, only they was down to really like 400 traction. Yeah, yeah, there was there were issues with, with I think the whole vision for it, <laughs> and um, the way they rolled it out and promoted it was very confusing. There was a brief bright period for it after um, I think it was QuakeCon when mm -hmm. our kind of group form, initially formed around it and said, "Yeah, let's play some Quake," and it just died hard after that. Yep. Yeah, I think they were up to like five thousand active users per day or something like that and then now it's like 200 yeah. well, i remember when we started playing left 4 dead 2 again briefly i went to twitch and i looked up left 4 dead 2 and that game that was 10 years old had more viewers than quake champions did on twitch right. so that was kind of it was they just they never put the care into it that it needed i don't think well and i think there's a there, there's sort of a um like a testament to to diabolical and yeah it's new but the fact that it's in closed beta right now and the match times are like really quick at the moment like they're almost instantaneous in a lot of cases is, is kind of just shows the staying power like it feels really polished for closed beta in a lot of ways um like yeah there's some things that they got to tweak like you get stuck in some corners and there's some weird shit like that but like overall it's actually pretty it, it, it's just it, it feels really good like they did a really really good job on it it's pretty and polished the fact for they, a beta yeah and the fact right. they built the engine from scratch right which is crazy apparently right. one it's... dude did it uh fire frog something like that one dude over the last couple of years has apparently done all the primary engine development um mm -hmm. he's that must be a dude who doesn't sleep very do much <laughs> i guarantee he well, it's, it does feel really good and i also find that it's a problem I have in a lot of games nowadays is when I die, I don't understand why. And <clears throat> I'm still brand new to Diabolical, so I'm still figuring things out how they work. But for the <clears throat> most part, I understand that when I've lost, it's because I did bad, not because the game is punishing me for not understanding something visually or something like that. Well, and it's this is like kind of an interesting testament to it, talking about the viewers, right? So right now on Twitch, as we record this moment, there's 853 viewers on Diabotical at the moment. And as we speak at the exact same moment, there's 57 viewers on Quake Champions. Yeah, that game is, it's, I don't think it's, I don't know why it's still early access. What Does else matter? are they going to do? I think I most not. consumers have caught on to the fact that early access doesn't really mean anything. No, it's think? just a way you can release a game that isn't complete yet and have an excuse for complaints. I mean, there is a right way to do early access where you're actually communicating with people and having meaningful iterations and changes to the game. Like, that's exactly what we're seeing with Diabotical. I don't know if you guys have been paying attention to um, to Too Good, uh, the head developer, the visionary behind this whole thing. Yeah. This, he's been doing streams every day, talking about how things are going, talking about what they're going to change, taking suggestions and giving real responses like this. It feels like we're actually part of making the game, which is what early access should be, not just a, a cast, a cash grab to continue development, which kind of felt like Quake was doing. That's exactly yeah. what it did, because it, it, it's Quake, if you remember, Quake became free after it cost money at first. No, like, that's very true. Yeah, whereas Diabolical is just a free open beta. Yeah, because they were doing things where you had to like buy the characters, which was like really fucking stupid in the first place, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, it's it's really interesting too because, I, and I don't know if you guys have looked at his like interaction with the community, the Two God guy, but he like is so actively engaged with the community. Like he does his Twitch streams constantly. He's like talking on Reddit all the time. He's on Twitter all the time, and it's interesting because like and Greg, you and I were talking about this a little bit earlier, but he has a very concrete vision for what he wants it to be. But at the same time, he also takes feedback constructively. And he's not just doing what everybody's telling him to do, because it's just like very much like a, like otherwise it's just a laundry list of shit. He's actually like trying to create almost a cohesive roadmap for the game from that feedback and then really fixing glaring issues at the same time. So it's, it's, it's kind of refreshing because then it, it, you see a game that's not, it's not really like, 
the the developers and the people that are running it are not at the mercy of like say the shareholders or like a larger company right now they're just sort of able to do the make the best game best game that they possibly can and the the super amount of customization they offer for uh the interaction of weapons in the hud that i'll pay full price for it i think just because of that because that's an yeah. amazing feature that i didn't realize i wanted so badly in every game like the, the fact decals that you can the hud both. Huh. No, I'm not talking about the decals of the character. I'm talking about the way you can customize your field of view for when you're playing, but also your field of view for right. when you zoom in. But then right. you can also customize that for each weapon specifically. Each weapon and as well super sensitivity. duper nerdy mouse sensitivity controls. I was reading right. apparently they, they run the, the mouse input on a completely separate processor thread from, from the game from the rest of the game engine. So it's not tied to your frame rate at all, which is so cool. They're setting up for esports for sure. It's like, and and they do. It's interesting too because it, while it is like still very much like you could say it's a reskin of Quake, like there are a lot of really thoughtful changes I think than what Quake never had before. So like, I think that the fact that they've where strafe jumping isn't really it's more of an exploit of previous Quakes. This is something that's like it's designed as part of the core gameplay. Like the fact that you get a circle jump by using the dodge function, right? Like that's like a deliberate design choice that they made. Um, or the way that they like kind of change the dynamic of Instagib instead of just being a railgun thing, they do it with those uh, crossbows, which adds Weebo. like a bit of delay. Yeah, the Weebo. And that it's like it adds so this delay. It's really fun. It's really fun because you don't have like those people that are just decimating you across the map all the time. So yeah. it's a little bit more conducive to newer players. It adds a bit more of a challenge to it. So, and Weibo has the whole kill confirm mechanic where you don't get points yep. for kills; you get points for picking up coins from people you kill. So it kind of disincentivizes the whole long range sniping thing that's so unfun to play against. Yeah, right. <clears throat> well, also when it when you said that it's just reskin Quake, that's fine. Uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I don't think Quake was broken. Quake was just old. But Quake Champions tried to fix what wasn't broken. Right, and... but they improved upon it with this game. Right. Yeah, my sense so, like, I mean, it was just like it was fixing a problem that didn't exist. Yeah. I mean, obviously there are the different design choices to do to do heroes versus not to do heroes. That that's a big uh, divergence between the two. But um it's very interesting, I think, to look at a game like Quake Champions and a game like Diabotical and examine the choices they made, not on how to recapture Quake, but how to iterate on it. Um, I've been really fascinated not to see how faithful it is to Quake, uh, Diabotical, that is, but all the little things they're doing to be like, yeah, this is what Quake could be in the future. The Weebles, right. for example, was something I didn't know I was going to care about, but they turned out to be a really fun team play mechanic. It is. And the fact that it's 5v5 is cool. And, like, we've only been playing, like, what, like, three versions of the game. It's, like, you play, play 1v1 Rocket Arena, you play yeah. the 5v5 Arena, and then the 5v5 Instagib, or whatever it's called. Weebo. Weebo. Yeah, and all the modes have a cool, um, interesting team play mechanic that is not just old school Quake. It's not just yep. movement and shooting and positioning. You know, one of the interesting points that actually... Uh, uh, lat raised when I was just talking to him about <laughs> differences is um had you guys noticed that none of the modes that we've gotten to play this weekend have item pickups? Yeah. Oh yeah. That's I right. don't mind that very much. The practice mode mind does. It. Right. One of the things that Lat told, let me in on is that apparently there is a big internal debate going on among among alpha testers about whether or not diabolical should even have modes with 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 uh, items in it which the dual mode traditionally revolves around and which team deathmatch traditionally has because the it's item whole, control yeah yeah the, the whole item control thing is one of the most alienating things for new players because it they feel like they get into the game and even if they can shoot a rocket maybe they just can't find a rocket launcher and if they know where it is they can't get to it because some tryhard is controlling the shit out of it you know what i'm saying right i'm fine without them i haven't that's this is not an element of the gameplay that I care about at all. Right. I didn't. I'm. I've never been huge into Quake to begin with, though. We're all casual until... Quake players. All three of us here. Yeah. Right. But yeah, I think to spawn and have a set of weapons already is what I'm used to from the world of Team Fortress Classics. So I don't have any problem with that at all. Me too. And you know, um, he told me about 
um, a take on capture the flag that he hopes Diabotical goes with, where they actually use a fortress-esque class design where you get to pick essentially item loadouts, um, not different like health and armor or anything like that or movement speed, but just, you know, one class is the shotgun and the rocket launcher. One class is like the lightning gun and whatever else. Um, and have that be like a, a very light fortress-esque CTF experience. What would you guys think of that? I'm not I sure that'd be fun. Yeah, because especially you're going to create different item, like sort of loadout dynamics based on what the map is, which is cool. Um, yeah, I think that could be interesting. I mean, maybe the game's so successful that one day we see the Diabolical Fortress Classic mod. Well, well that's the thing. It's like, so they, they, the developers have designed it in a way to be extremely mod friendly. So you could, yeah. I know that when it's fully out, like you could effectively create a Team Fortress Classic mod or a Counter Strike mod from the Diabolical engine. <laughs> which would be cool. amazing and the maps the map thing too i think i thought that was really cool too the fact that the map like designer is in the game itself the map designer is so impressive yeah it reminds me a lot of um taylor i know you've played mario maker right yeah it's kind of like that like honestly it's like a arena version of mario maker's map design i haven't explored that yet but that sounds great yeah because that's apparently something i mean that another that's another failing of quake champions is quake didn't survive just by all the standard maps, did it? There was tons of community maps that I'm sure made it even better than it was, just like with TFC. But when you have full control of all the servers and everything, no one was making any maps for Quake Champions. Dude, you know what we should make? We should make a rocket a rocket jump obstacle map for uh for Diabotical. Oh yeah. Like a conch map, but for yes. rocket jumping. Well you could make a conch map too with their little weeble whatever That's true. thing. That's yeah, conk weeble. Hand but you conk. could use the little uh the handheld thing that you get in the Weeble Weebolt version. Yeah, it's it's more of a it's more of a rocket launcher though. Yeah. Well it's if we're talking about what I think we're talking about, the thing that you can throw with R and insta gib mode. Yeah. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, well that's designed to just knock the shit out of people. It has way more um I don't know what the term is, lift blast radius than just a rocket so it's designed to knock people around just like a conch is right it just it just doesn't have a hold time yep it's a good point and i guess one of the things too is if you're using it on yourself you have to kind of aim it like you would a rocket jump yeah mm. but anyway yeah the emphasis not just on having a new version of quake that does something different has something for casual players has more team play stuff but also that gives people more autonomy over their game which is kind of like a throwback to the old days of online games where we were all hosting our own servers. Uh, it's all so cool. I struggle to find anything bad to say about this game. Yeah, it's really yeah, good. I, I, I'm just excited to see what how the other game modes play, to be honest. Right. Matt and I did some one versus one rocket arena earlier, and it was just it's fun. I don't there was everything just felt good, looked good. No well, even like or anything that that's one of so this is another thing that I think is like really a testament to like how deliberate the design of the game is. So like w with Quake Champions, you have these maps, right? And they would basically repurpose the maps for all of the game modes. So you'd have the same map for CTF or for TDM or for Instagram, whatever, right? They were, they were like the same maps over and over with this. It's like the maps are actually designed specifically for the game mode, which I find is a huge testament to like how thoughtful it is. So when we're playing those one versus one or two V two, like rocket arena uh, games, it's designed for close quarters combat, which is like more conducive right. for rockets. Right. Right. And right. that, that sort of thing that it's like that level of detail that they've, they've given it is I think what I'm hoping is going to make it more successful. Yeah. I hope so. I hope it takes off. I hope it attracts a whole bunch of people who aren't way better than me at the game. So I can actually enjoy playing it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's the trick. You have to have enough of a casual base so that the, the people like us can actually log in and have fun and not only mm -hmm. play the lats of the world. Yeah, lats insane. Yeah. Professional uh, Quake player right there. But you know what I want? I want Weibo on DM17. That's what I fucking want. Do you know what I want? A fucking Weibo like Funko doll. Like an egg ball Funko? I have nothing Funko? to add about this. You know those little vinyl figurines? Well, wouldn't they just uh, take a cube? They're going to turn an orb into a cube then. Why does it have to be a cube? Because they're all cubes. That's all their thing is. They take a character and they give it a cube head and they charge you money. I guess so. That's fair. But the, 
yeah, so we'll take Matt's Eggbot design, which is a dude in squealing in joy at being splooged on by his own dick, <laughs> and then turn that into a Funko Pop. Uh, yeah, that was, that was I don't a very see clever a problem with this. I, it was inspired by someone on Reddit, but I think I did it better. I think you did. <laughs> Apparently, all those decals that we have access to freely are is what is going to be behind the microtransactions. It's how they're going to actually make money off the game. They're going to sell you those things. So yeah, designing that's a, that dick is going to cost me like 20 bucks? Yeah. It's totally worth it. Totally worth see, it. See, even... I mean, the, in terms of microtransactions, that's the best implementation I can possibly think of because that's not going to affect how the game is played at all. It's perfect. Yeah, it's kind of similar to the Overwatch model. I just hope, I hope they avoid the landmine of loot boxes. I can't imagine the Too Good is stupid enough to try to do loot boxes. I don't think he will. I think it's yeah, loot boxes are something that really, really hardcore gamers hate. And that's what this game is designed for. And they're also, I think, and this is something that, you, Matt, you've talked to me about a little bit. Probably as time goes on, they're more and more likely to get regulated to a point where it's hard to make money off of them. Yep. Because of the fact that they are effectively gambling, in a sense. I can't think of a game I have played where I've encountered a loot box. Quick Champions. Planet Side. Oh, oh is it all the damn backpacks of those loot boxes? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's dumb as hell. <laughs> Especially when you have to open them one at a time, spend three hours <laughs> opening all your <laughs> bags. <laughs> Whoever got that animation, man. Whoever made that animation, it's like the most viewed animation in Quake Champions. That, <laughs> that and the, the clock for the uh, loading screen while you're waiting to be matched. Those yes. are the two most viewed animations in Quake Champions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and it's it's going to be cool for us because the three of us still log in and up till now have played Quake like once or twice a month just because nothing else feels like it. Um, but we can't no, actually bad. match make because you can't get a game. We just go load into a custom game and do whatever. It'll be cool now to take that experience and channel into Diabotical, a game that's got legs and something for us to progress. Um, I, I'm just excited about it. So on another funny uh, note, the Quake Champions subreddit has banned any mention of Diabotical. So if anybody <laughs> says Diabotical on the Quake Champions Champion subreddit, they get banned. Is that subreddit owned by id? Probably. Or Saber. <laughs> <laughs> Saber moderates it. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a petty fucking move. Yeah, it's really funny. It but reminds just, me what's... of uh, something I read about um, the studio that made Anthem. What are they called again? Bioware? Valve, no, uh, Bio Bioware. yeah, that's Bioware. Bioware made Anthem, apparently, Anthem. which 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 famously bombed right last year. And what I read about that team is apparently they completely banned the word Destiny from their development discussions. Oh really? <laughs> they were so afraid to compare what they were making to it. You know, Anthem is one of those games where I just looked at it and knew it was going to be a failure. I don't know what it was about it. But just one glimpse, and I, everyone started hyping it up, and I was like, "Guys, this, this looks terrible. Why is are any of you excited?" And then it was a People huge bomb. Dumb. They don't know what's good. D Dunkey had a really funny video about Anthem. I would highly suggest everybody watch it. Did he have a take on why people were attracted to it? Uh, no. You just have to watch the video. It's really kind of satirical. It's kind of hard to explain. Yeah, he, yeah, I would love he just to see if they. He made a. He said Anthem's a bomb, and it'll be performing poorly until an executive somewhere has a great idea to introduce a brand new battle royale mode. Yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering if that actually happened. Well, that was the joke, is then, what's the game? Um, Apex, right? Then, because it's not the same studio if I remember, at all, if I remember correctly, right? Apex is Respawn, the guys who made That's Titanfall. Right. Which that yeah. game has kind of fizzled out, it feels. They're all fizzling Apex? out, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I still see lots of stuff on Reddit about it, rising to the top. But I just Apex is doing I, okay. It's just it's just fighting Fortnite on its home turf and not winning. What I can I tell, I just don't get the appeal. PUBG, Fortnite, Apex. It's just so much time wasted. So here's my it. here's something about Planet Side that I like, which maybe this is something similar people got at Royale's. What I like about Planet Side is I get to play a shooter with some RPG progression mechanics, where it's not always about like it's not always hardcore nail biting like skin of your teeth winning 
Like there, there's downtime. You can lean a lot on your team. There's some um, rock, rock, paper, scissors kind of stuff where some of it, your success is determined by not just how well you fight, but what you choose to bring to a fight. It kind of takes some of the pressure off the moment to moment a little bit. It's a little more of a, I don't know, a little more of a sandboxy experience. Maybe that's what people get out of battle royales or maybe I'm full of shit. None of us play in there, so why am I even Well, asking? I know part of the reason Dosback likes PUBG so much is because he has a child and a wife. And so the way the game works for him is he just pops in for a round and basically gives himself 20 minutes to play a game, and then he's done for a bit. He doesn't have the time to sit down and engage in huge amounts of games, but he's also been playing it since the beginning, so he knows how to make that one or two rounds that he gets count. Whereas whenever I play it, It was just, you know, I spent 10 minutes of my time looking for weapons and then some guy 400 yards away that I couldn't see shot me in the face. And what was any of this to me? I don't want to do this twice. I don't know, though. There are a ton of games, competitive games that you can play for 20 minutes and have an okay experience. It's enough time to have like two or three rounds of Overwatch. It's enough time to have a round or two of Counter-Strike. Like the, the argument that Battle Royales are good because they're digestible. I think it's something that is shared by a lot of other similar non-Royale titles. Right. The other, I mean, the other difference with Battle Royale, the int- I'll say about this about Fortnite specifically, is that like amongst like the teenagers, like what the kids are doing these days, they like see it as a way to like hang out with their friends. Like it's right. not even like playing the game competitively anymore. It's like just their, you know, people hanging out with their bros, like chatting away. Right. I remember we used to do that. Days. Yeah, it's the same. You deal. all hop into a server and you chat there instead of chatting in IRC. For some reason, it's you have you then have a personification of who you're talking to, and that's well, really and interesting. Then there's there's also like the whole competitive like uh, scrimmage scene of TFC two, which was interesting, right? Which was also like sort of social at the same time, but also like a big dick waving thing. Yes, it was. It was great fun. Yeah, and maybe waving dicks around. maybe the reason that Royale does good at that kind of party socialization games because it's it, it it you're so rewarded by queuing in as a group um right because it, you, you have such a stronger possibility of winning and and you share the victory if you're if if your guys win i think yeah shared experiences i mean not just literally like have enjoying that time together but i also mean the win condition is shared with the people you queue with i think yeah yeah you're all kind of allied together that's how it works apex you know, you're always a team of three yeah. You know what's crazy about Apex versus Fortnite? Apex has twice the amount of subscribers on sub on their subreddit as Fortnite does. Huh. Eight hundred ninety-two thousand subscribers versus four hundred and ninety something. What's that mean per- to you, Matt? What do you think? That the Reddit demographic plays more Apex than Fortnite. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's that's just, they can, that's they can all write complete sentences. Yeah, the people that can actually write a complete sentence play Apex. <laughs> I don't versus know. The it, Zoomers. I think it's so hard to compare Fortnite with anything because it's such an outlier. You know what I'm saying? Um, everything about it is so. Uh, it's like it, it's it's kind of like comparing Counter Strike to TFC. I don't know if you guys have tried to do that or Counter Strike. Its success is just so outlandish. The fact that a game can go 20 years without being changed at all and still be one of the biggest esports in the whole world, it makes no fucking sense. <laughs> yeah, the fact that CSGO is still the number one game on the Steam charts. Like, after... When did they first play Counter-Strike? 19, 2000, I think, was when I first played it. Yep. Like, in 20 years, it's still the number one game. It's fucking ridiculous. I remember downloading the 500 megabyte package to install the game, and I was thinking, oh my god, I'm never going to be able to finish this download. This is huge. Actually, let's see how many subscribers they have on their subreddit. God, my internet's going slow. I bet you remember... Million. One million on the CSGO subreddit. Nice. Most so, of my... More than both of them. All of my Counter-Strike experience was, uh, what is it, 1.6? Anything before that? I don't think I ever played Source, really, or anything beyond that. It might be fun now. I should give that a shot. You should try CSGO. It, it's actually... I, I think it's pretty good, to be honest. I just... When, uh, when TF 1.5 came out, and... I, th- I felt like it broke the whole game and I just abandoned it for a bit and played Counter-Strike only for a while. and that. But then eventually I went back to it and everything was fixed and normal. Y'all are lame. Yeah. TFC rules, Counter-Strike rules. Fuck y'all haters. I like both of them. Did you know that I used to be uh, an operator in the Counter-Strike IRC channel, their official IRC channel? 
How did that? Did feel? know that because you told us. Little known fact. Plenty of your and that. yeah, I tell it's. I also tell people that I used to write for CS Nation, which is also you, a true fact. You told us that too. It's totally my most famous thing about this me. This isn't a fucking I'm rerun, man. Wet just thinking about it. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta call up all my old boys, the ones that work at Valve, and be like, "Yo, give me some free shit." Yeah. <laughs> you, you and Kelly, <laughs> ring him up. Yeah, I remember me when I was a troll. It's, <laughs> I guess Counter Strike's in the end the only mod that really well no Team Fortress also TF2 super is huge yeah like, TF, that was Team Fortress game. and Counter Strike are the only two mods that really made it beyond Half Life yeah and TF went casual and CS uh, went competitive Day of Defeat was really popular too but it didn't yeah, ever make it, got it swallowed past. up by Call of Duty though yeah. yeah there wasn't room for both both of them in the space was there a fourth there was Frontline I think that was the fourth biggest one Gary's mod. That was Action Half Life. No, Gary's the original Gary's mod was Half Life, wasn't it? I don't think so. No, I think I it was know, always Half Life Two. Half Life Two is when all the fun stuff came out. I don't recall Half Life One being fun enough yeah. for Gary's mod to be successful. December, December two thousand four. I would. I always played Gary's mod with Fish, and he would try to make real constructive things, and I would just break them while he worked on them. I don't think he enjoyed that at all. Yeah, what other, I'm trying to like, I should actually look this up because it's been 16 years and my memory is not really good past like 10 minutes anyways. Um, I'm trying to look at some of the other mods that they had. Action Half-Life, Frontline, something. Firearms was a big one. Uh, oh, these are just the single, I found a list, but it's just the single player ones. But that I was, was, Portal. It was Portal. That was a hell Portal of a weird Half-Life mod. mod. What was natural selection? Did you guys play that? Oh, I remember that. I that never got into that game. at all. It was really interesting. I played a bunch of it, the Half Life One version, and I never played the successor. I really enjoyed it a lot too. It was super fun. Are you familiar with it, Taylor? I never played it. I it's remember everyone talking about game. it. it. It's a game that that tried to introduce a lot of RPG mechanics into a team based um, shooter. And it was completely asymmetrical, like StarCraft style, kind of like Marines versus Zerg. Um, yeah, it, and it was very... It's one of the more unique games I've ever played. Yeah, it was really fun. It was really bizarre, but it, it somehow worked. I don't um, know why I never got it. I remember tons of people who played TFC played it. So I'm looking at some of the other mods. They had Ricochet. Do you guys remember that one, too? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that was created. Yeah, Rick Portal is another set of successful Half Life mods. Never heard of Portal. Portal? Really? <laughs> are you are you being serious right now, or is that like a sarcastic comment? Why are we going down this list? Of course, I've heard of Portal. Oh, I was about to fucking say. <laughs> I would have left right this second. Um, no, because the whole reason we're looking at the list, see if there's any other ones that went uh, famous. Portal but is probably the, the most I've been famous among normal people. I'm yeah. unclear on the origins of Left 4 Dead. Is it was it a, a mod by another name? No, Valve made it its own thing. Valve didn't develop it. Turtle Rocks. Oh, I can't keep it straight. Turtle Rock Studio developed it, I think, and then Valve slapped their name on it. I thought Valve bought Turtle Rock before it was no. released. I don't remember. It's in the documentary <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> I just don't remember the ads. But I always remember there there was some mod mentioned that either heavily inspired Left 4 Dead or something. Dude, know. I'm looking at this mod list right now, and some of these are so weird, I've never even heard of them. Goldeneye Source? Like... <laughs> uh, yeah, baby, I remember that. I remember Star reading Trek news articles Emmer on that. There was Star a Goldeneye Enterprise? There's, that's, that was the thing about Valve games, is there were so many mods. That's why they were so successful. Well, I don't know yeah, if, if mods make made Half-Life successful, but it definitely made it unique. Um, there was there was Monster no other game kept it around. I mean, Counter Strike's a mod. That's what Counter Strike is a mod. Counter Strike is a game that was started as a mod that Valve bought and then made it made a separate game out of. Like same thing with right, Team Fortress. That's... Like Team Fortress Classic was a game that started as a mod, and so was Day of Defeat. Then I think that went on for a while, pretty successful with Day of Defeat Source. But that okay. was a mod for Half Life. So other a... than just just having a nice reminiscence jerk off, what's the point of going down memory lane here? To jerk off. Oh, right. I think we started this whole conversation about the modding friendliness of Diabotical. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that sounds like it has an iota of relevance, unlike the rest of this. Uh, Anyways, maybe we should... <laughs> 
Should we change gears to Half Life? Uh, sounds like we already have. What's there? Oh, Half Life. Yeah, <laughs> there yeah, is new Half Life shit the coming out. I just fucked up thing that came your, out today. your beautiful transition. I'm gonna let you run with it. Go. So yeah, there was a gameplay trailer. Uh, apparently, Valve team can count to three because this is the third gameplay trailer that they have released. Um, Confirmed for Alex. Yeah, and I thought, have you guys watched it? Yes, I watched a couple of them. Yeah, it looks it looks like you're watching a cutscene. It's not. I watched the game. Did you watch one, one today? Yeah. Yeah. So the two things that I thought were interesting that they showcased in this one today was one, um, the fact that you can interact like with the environment in a lot of similar ways, but new ways than what they did with, um, like kind of like what they did with the previous half life games. So like the fact that like, if someone throws a grenade at you, you can catch it and throw it back at them. Yeah. Um, which I thought was really, really interesting. Uh, and then, of course, the classic box breaking of every Half-Life game. Um, but then the other thing that I thought was cool was that they showed the teleportation, which I know a lot of people gave them shit for. Right. But it actually looked pretty fluid. Yeah, the There's first time I saw it, I was like, oh, no. But as the demo went on, I was like, okay. Like, I don't know what it is. You see, I'm, I'm, I think I'm the only person here who has not yet done VR. Am I? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you have a set, I and I know that, Taylor, you you've experienced it. Um, can you can, can you guys describe to me as a VR layman what the virtue of having the whole like casting your perspective thing versus actually moving like step by step is? I think you can run out of space to walk, so you can't okay. really do that. Well, what about but, having like a like? Don't the gloves have like a stick on them you can control yourself with, or, or am I misunderstanding how that all works? They do, but the problem is, is that like it's not the same as like a mouse and a keyboard, right? So like, if you think about a mouse and a keyboard, effectively your mouse is your head, right? And then the keyboard yeah. is your your sort of physical position in space. Your feet. The problem, yeah, your feet. The problem with VR and using that same sort of model is that it gets really disorienting really quickly because you're moving forward. But then all of a sudden, your perspective is like to the side, for example. And so it doesn't control in the same way. So I noticed this actually a lot with, and, and it works really well in racing games, specifically for VR, where, and, and why it's sort of an advantage. Um, if, if racing games had that sort of a pe like ability to sort of look like a mouse um, while still controlling your driving, it, I'm totally misexplaining this. Basically, like it works in a racing game because your body is like physically placed inside of it's that stationary car. You're not actually within a moving object. Yes. Right. Exactly. So think think if you walked in real life and you automatically walked forward any direction you looked while you were walking. Yeah. That would be the problem with doing that in VR. Exactly. I think that which uh, it seems like it could easily be fixed by just making a button that is permanently assigned to some axis or something like that. I'm not certain. I feel I like your paraman in our spinning. stream chat here just just dropped the right word for it. Motion sickness is mitigated motion by the teleport. Sickness. Is what he says. Does that summarize what right. you were trying to explain, Matt? Yeah, it's definitely motion sickness because, like, again, you can't like you would just keep moving in really weird directions. You can't really like separate your body, like your movement from your looking very well. Yeah, yeah. Like you can with a mouse. Proprioception is a big word that means the sense of being in your body. I, I imagine that gets super duper fucked up when your 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 senses get hijacked by the VR set. Who used that word? That's a big word. It's a word I happen <laughs> to know that I like to trot out to prove that I'm I'm, I'm hyper intelligent. I I feel like I'm really dumb now having heard that. That so was good the job. idea. But so the the only <laughs> shooting experience I've had in VR is with a super hot where right. you can't. There's no walking at all, really, the way they designed it. But it was still really excellently done because you don't. There's so much going on that you don't really think about the fact that you're not walking. You could still sort of move because you have to dodge bullets all the time. And I did it so much that I was sore the next day, which I thought was great. Like I would, I love it when a video game can make me ache the next day. But Alex looks so engaging with just how much is around you that you can interact with that i think the fact that you can't walk places is really just going to fall to the back of everyone's mind i i agree with that and i mean i've played so skyrim vr is like an incredibly disorienting vr experience too because oh. it just doesn't port very well in that regard because it's like it has the walking on the controller and then you have your head to look around it's, just, it's terrible like i'm not a fan of it oh i played um, 
Borderlands 2 VR as well, and that was the biggest piece of shit I've ever played in my life. It yeah, a lot of the awful. ports, a lot of the ports are not very good. But I, I think why VR, like Half Life VR, Alex is going to work is that they're designing the levels with VR in mind. So it's like it's not like you're taking a, a standard mouse and keyboard game or controller game, right, and porting that to VR to make it work because the the movement configuration is just not going to work correctly. It's that they're actually designing their levels, knowing that people are. Or at least I'm hoping. I'm just making an assumption here, but they uh they're designing it with with the fact that they have teleporting in mind and the fact that like most of the people playing the game are going to be physically stationary um and not walking around in 3d space right right i mean from the demos i've seen it looks like it's more uh quality than quantity i guess is the best way to say it so like in half-life 2 when you're in a battle there's enemies everywhere but in the battles i've seen so far it looks like there's only a handful but you've got to be thoughtful and clever about how to deal with them because each one's a bigger threat. I'm just basing that off the four minute video clips I've seen, but that's what it strikes me as. By the way, Pigeons just posted this about the day of defeat, um, a funny anecdote uh, in a different channel. And it says, I was in the server when the DOD team had Gabe and Doug join to see if they liked it enough to buy it. I remember them telling me how to swear because all chat was on and they said, Pidge, shh, Gabe and Doug are here and me going, who the fuck are they? <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty funny yeah good one you cockeyed <laughs> fuck so getting back to the the alex gameplay though um one of the things i remember uh, jeff Keeley, the host of the video game awards he did an interview with robin walker and some of the other guys behind half life alex when they first announced it mm-hmm. and one of the things that that they talked about was you know why re-engage with half-life after having so long of kind of not touching it um and they said well we wanted to make a vr game and then we kind of came to half-life as a result of vr rather than the other way around and they want to make a game that is not ported to vr but a game that is made for vr and watching this demo i kind of get it i feel like right that one gameplay sequence on, on the GameSpot demo where he's um, kind of in the outdoor area, and there are enemy, and he's moving around behind between cover and grabbing grenades and slotting shit into his weapon. And I was like, oh, yeah, I I get what's cool about this now. What I'm curious yeah. about with it is that so it's today is the second of March, and the release date is the twentieth of March, and so the review embargo must be lifted soon. I'm guessing, correct? It would seem uh, logical. I would assume so. See, people, people probably are playing it right now, and I'm really, really curious to see kind of just what, what people think of it. I'm just like, I'm curious just in terms of, I don't know of another 12-hour-long VR game. I don't know right. of anyone who's been played a VR game that's meant to be played for that long. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a late adopter for most technology. Um, we'll see, that's... As a result, you know, you guys have heard me say I have not touched VR, but looking at Alex... It looks like it's the first game that I've seen that have made me has made me want to actually experience VR. Everything else VR I've seen is really amazing. You'll you'll go in, you'll enjoy it a lot when you can finally try it. The thing that it's, I so Half Life Alex looks like it's designed with the Vive in mind, which from what I understand you have the index, individual. Not the Vive. I'm not the Vive, sorry, the Index, which works with individual fingers, right? Yep. So that's the part that makes me super interested, but that's a thousand dollars. Yeah, so, it, it, it apparently it's going to work with all of them, though. Well, I know it'll work with all of them, but how much more fun will it be with an index than with just a regular one? Ask your mom how individual fingers are. Ooh. That's terrible. <laughs> I don't want to do that. No, I think I, that's going to be the best experience. Like, if you look at the loading mechanics and the fact that you catch everything, and I'm sure there's a way they do it. It's just probably much better on the index. As I say this with my index controllers right here in front of me. Yeah, you've right. got one. Is your streaming setup gonna so you're you're moving to a new place, Matt, and yep. I imagine one of your one of the rooms in your future mansion is gonna be your VR room, right? Yeah, the, well it's gonna be my office. So I'm not right now my office is also my storage room and my guest bedroom as well. And so there's not a lot of space for it. But the in the new place i'm gonna actually have uh, a dedicated office which is effectively an open room that i can vr in as well so and i'll be able to stream it so we need the awkward matte body cam so we can watch you stumble around 
<laughs> while you're playing. And of course, the perspective stream so we can see what you're actually seeing. Like, Dude, the amount of Star happen. Wars kids gifts that are going to happen out of, as a result of yes. that are yes. fucking crazy. I remember I was when I played it at my friend's house, <clears throat> I had to tell him, you know, like, stand in front of the TV so I can't accidentally slap the shit out of it. Make sure I don't break it. So there's a... Because you have worse uh, than bad luck. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> there's a uh, point in our living room where when I have the door open in my office that you can see the reflection in the window for, like, right from the couch. And Allison has a whole bunch of videos of me playing VR, recording my reflection of it. And I look like a fucking idiot. Like, nobody <laughs> looks good playing <laughs> <in> VR. <laughs> Especially yeah. Super- where it's like you're trying to like contort your body in ways to not get hit by the bullets. You got this big fucking helmet on your head with wires coming out. There's no way to look cool doing that. God, I really hope they come out with a wireless one though. I would imagine that's so much latency it's issues. Not wireless? No, they have a, a. It's because the bandwidth required for the index is so high. They don't. They haven't released a wireless adapter for it yet. But apparently, Intel is like actively working on the technology that is a dependency for the index becoming wireless. Oh, take a note from Pigeons. Every time he posts a picture of his VR setup in his basement, he has a clip on the ceiling that holds the wire. I think I'm going to do that same thing. That's a good yeah. good idea. Or just wait for a fucking wireless thing to come out. I do have the prescription uh, lenses, though, from that now. Great. I'll never forget. <laughs> wait, what are the prescription lenses for VR? So that I can not have to wear my contacts when I use it. Oh, you mean there's actually you can change the glass inside of VR headsets to match yeah, your eye prescription? Little things, yeah, they're little things that just go over the top of it. Oh, that's neat. I Do didn't know that. To say? I we have we've had this conversation before, so I'm I'm confused, Taylor, why you're <laughs> why you're asking for clarification? Because the last time Matt, or maybe maybe it was Tim. It, no, no, okay, my bad. It was not Taylor. It was Will. Matt, yeah, do you remember when you were telling you. Will about your, <laughs> about your, your oh, VR yeah, lenses? Right. <laughs> and he had this. Yeah, so he was like, what are you looking at? Like, what does it take ca- pictures of? <laughs> I think our, our poor friend Will had the idea that, 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 that Matt had somehow gotten VR contact lenses. Yeah, VR contact <laughs> lenses. What do you mean? What do you actually his, see? Is it AR? Is it augmented reality? <laughs> And it wasn't like it wasn't like disbelief or like or like ridicule. It was like awe. That was his reaction. It was pure. Yeah, these rich people like, get some awesome shit. <laughs> In his defense, I think he was a little stoned. Which w- the will that I know or the will that you know? Uh, my will. Okay. Because the will that I know is apparently always stoned now, so that would make sense. I guess will is synonymous with being stoned. Mm-hmm. When there's a will, there's a weed. <laughs> But yeah, Half-Life Alex is one of uh, a couple games coming out soon that I don't think I get to play for a bit, and it makes me kind of sad. Yeah, you gotta buy a VR headset, cheapo. Well, I just, I want to play it on the Index, but I don't want to spend $1,000. I haven't looked at any other headsets price-wise either. When's your birthday? I, April 1st. This is, how, what a joke. <laughs> at your birthday. <laughs> That's so appropriate. <laughs> You know what I should do? I'll send you an index, but really, it'll just be my, the box for my index, and it'll be filled <laughs> with a giant pile of shit. <laughs> and I'll be like, April Fools. Thank you. <laughs> but what I'm afraid of is all... It's like the same reason I want a PlayStation 4 is because there's a couple games coming out, but I don't want to put down all that money for just one game is the problem. I don't know what else I'm going to use it for. I guess there's a few other VR titles that I like, and I know VR is amazing. You'd like Beat Saber, I think. Oh, I yeah, love Beat, Beat Saber. I played it. It's fucking yeah. great. Yeah. Um, the other ones that are good are apparently Pavlov is supposed to be really good too. Pigeons and I were going to play that. That's like a shooter, right? Giant. Yeah. Yeah, we need yeah. to get Pigeons on here to talk about VR. Separate conversation. Yeah. But that, He's got that the most experience playing it, I would say. Yeah. Like VR game. I play. I mean, I mostly honestly like. The VR game that gets the most attention from me is uh, the racing sims. Like, it is the best way to play racing games, in my opinion. Um, and and the funny thing about it is I played them on the other sets, but the index's refresh rate makes it so you don't get so much motion sickness with it. Uh, it doesn't actually really affect you at all. It's it's the closest thing to like actually driving a real car. Mario Kart VR when? 
Does it make you feel like Spider Man? <laughs> yeah, it makes you feel like. <laughs> Actually, Spider Man VR could be lit. Although that is motion sickness central, I'm sure. Yeah, that'd be kind of nuts to handle. But it is interesting that the 120 hertz of the index does make a difference for motion sickness. I it think. doesn't surprise me. Just staring at a computer Hardless. screen, 60 versus the other 20 makes a huge 60? difference. 60. Yeah, the other ones are 60. Except for I think the Vive is like 90 or something like that. My only experience was PlayStation VR, and I the only complaint I had is it wasn't the most comfortable thing to wear. The index is very comfortable as well. That's the other nice thing. And their hand, the the controllers are really comfortable too. It's like this nice, like soft felt that goes on your hand. How uh, how does it handle heat? Like, do you find you're sweating in it a lot? Uh, I mean, no, but I'm also like cold all the time. So, oh, you're a reptile. Yeah. Cool. But I know some people have complained about that. But the PlayStation one just felt like this big bulky thing that I couldn't get it close enough to my face to cover up the gap of light that you get between the bottom of your eyes and like the bridge of your nose, that area. And then I would start sweating because you're doing so much movement in it and it just gets more uncomfortable and it weighs a lot. So there's just a lot of negatives in that regard. But yeah, yeah, it's I've not really had any issues with it at all. So it's good. But um, yeah. So what about, uh, I guess, kind of shifting gears. What about Doom? Fucking Are you excited for Doom? Yep. I think that I'm going to actually pre-order that just so it's ready to go when I want to play it. Yeah, I have it pre-ordered, pre-installed. Playing the other one just to, you know, get through it. That's what I Feels did. Good. I started warming up on the old one. And it's still... It, I don't know how much advancements id Tech 6 has made because id Tech 5 still looks unbelievable three years later, four years later. They did a, they're doing a promo for Doom Eternal 2 where it's Doom 64 is free as well. Yeah, I will never play that, I'm sure. Yeah, neither will I. But that's that's just the pre-order bonus bullshit they came up with, I think, to get people to pre-order. But it's going to be a good game. I'm hoping otherwise. So it's funny because that game comes out same day as Alex, I believe. Yep. Which is a big move, but I don't have oh, a no, way sorry, to play Alex. Three days before. So Alex well, is March 23rd and Doom is March 20th. It just it looks like from what I've seen, they've because when i play doom again now i think the only complaint that i have is it it's when i played it the first time it didn't feel this way but now it feels a little bit slower but with things they have a dash mechanic they're adding and with the uh the base the grappling hook on the shotgun Mm -hmm. they're just they're adding in things that are removing all that downtime between enemies and so i think that's gonna be a big improvement overall for the game so i'm looking forward to that yeah i i am sad that it's not going to be as red because i actually like the redness of it but that's me it's not going to be as red yeah that's what they said apparently people complained about it being too red there was a lot of red but it's also hell and blood so i understood that yeah yeah I would by say- the way, sorry. one other quick thing about alex did you watch which version of the gameplay did you watch um i'm not sure did you watch, watch- the two minute version I watched two four minute videos, one with the zombies on a train part and then one fighting combine in a trash yard or something. There's a there's one that's nine minutes long. Is it just a continuous stream of both those areas? Maybe. I mean, either way, I guess they looks... released two different uh, gameplay uh, trailers today. Which well, I, I think. Didn't realize. <clears throat> well, I think also what happened is a bunch of journalists played it. So you have their different perspective playthroughs right. that they have on their websites, which is always the saddest part to see because a lot of video game journalists are really bad at games. It's true. Have you guys seen that guy? He played um, Cuphead and I think he also did a take on Doom Eternal. Dean yeah. Takahashi or something like that. Yeah, that shit was so bad. I wonder if that guy is trolling. Because It'd be hilarious if his was. videos and his content get a huge amount of attention. I think it's just because he's expected to be a terrible player. He is a bit surly. I've seen in his reactions, so it could be real. But if it wasn't real, that's some high IQ shit. Is it the same guy who did the terrible play of the first Doom? I yes. think so, yeah. Well, if they picked him to do the next Doom, then yes, that is intentional. He's intentionally trolling everybody. I would have to say so, because the first Doom, that was with Polygon. And he 
like could barely make it out of the first fight with the four zombies when you start the game. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> and so if they picked fair. him to do Doom Eternal, that's they knew what they were doing. Matt, I figured so you could funny. relate to this because you got stuck for like twenty minutes in the entry hallway. Oh please! <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was playing on Nightmare. It's a little different. The first part of even if I couldn't find my key card, but still. <laughs> Are you talking about when they introduced difficult. the imps for the first time? No. He got stuck was, at the door. Uh, he got, got to the door. the door. Couldn't you know the one where you pick up the shotgun and you you cock it? Um, he got stuck right before it because I think he needed to look down and pick up the shotgun from the dead body, and he just stumbled yeah, around and up and down that hallway it. like 15 minutes, being like, "There's that's some great there's, apathetic shit." There was too much red. That's why it was just too red. That area is blue. <laughs> Yeah, Dean Kakahashi is the lead writer for Games Beat. Apparently, he's been covering games for 21 years and has been a tech journalist for more than 28 years. That's the problem. Fucking old people. I know. How old is he? Kill me if I ever get that old. At least 28. It's going to happen eventually. I'll never be as old as him unless he dies. Right? That's the way time and space you mean, works. Well, you'll never be as, as old as him unless you die. Because then you wouldn't be getting older anymore. None of what you said makes sense to me. Okay. Doom. Doom is fun. That's what we were talking about. It's fun. It's fun. What do you guys think about the new, the new like traversal and movement stuff they're adding in this in Eternal? As long as it feels good, I think it's going to be great. Because I was saying, telling Matt this, it's when I play Doom again now. My only complaint is it somehow feels slow. The first time I played it, it didn't feel slow at all but now it just feels like there's a lot of downtime running between people but the dash mechanic and the grappling hook thing and if there's any other surprises they've added i think that is going to take all of that downtime away and make it so it's a much more um what's a fun word to use visceral experience i don't know Mm -hmm. i like the way that it um one of the things about the about doom 2016 i didn't like too much is the way some of the gameplay was paced out and that you had sections where you were just kind of ambling through and then you had set piece sections where you had to fight a bunch of mobs but that was pretty much it um there was uh, there were occasions where the pacing was broken up by a little bit of storytelling and those are my favorite that i think is the best way to pace it but i think pacing out the combat with some more traversal stuff is is going to make it um i don't know um i think it's better yeah they they said that was one of their biggest criticisms as it felt like you're just going from arena to arena. So they wanted to add yeah. a lot more in between classic first person shooter type stuff. So they've done that. Hopefully it makes it better. Um, the only things I haven't liked, and I think the last video I watched, I didn't have any of this is what I liked about the first one is you can't see his face and he doesn't make a fucking sound. But in this one, you kind of can see his face and he grunts all the time when he's hit. I hope that I can turn that off. But that's how the original one was. Uh, uh, the original I Doom. I still don't like it. Well, I kind of agree with Taylor a little bad. bit. I kind of like to role play as Alex Jones when I play these games. <laughs> you take a bunch of supplements <laughs> too. <laughs> Fucking demons turning the frogs gay. Yeah, the demons turn. <laughs> Well, yeah. it's in the first Doom, you're just you you have no face and you have no sounds. And what not, I love the first Doom, it's the 2016 Doom. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> in that Doom, you have no face and you have no sounds. And so it you don't even really have you don't have skin. It's just the suit. And it just makes you seem like this cold blooded killer. And that's even cooler by the fact that you as you play through the game, you learn that hell is afraid of you. And I thought that was the coolest twist to some sort of demon infestation story I'd ever heard, because I'd never heard it where the demons are terrified of this guy. Yeah. It's always the other way around. It's a genius inversion of expectations. I love it. Um, You know, uh, the first time I ever heard that phrase was from uh, the creative director on Doom and and then on the sequel, uh, Hugo Martin, I think his name is. Are you guys familiar Mm -hmm. with Hugo? No. That's a good name, though. You should look them up. Just watch him talk about Doom a little bit. He's going to get you excited to slay demons. You, have you ever had the experience of of, of watching some, um, someone who talks about food in a way that just gets you hungry? Yeah. Yeah. That's what listening to Hugo talk about Doom is like. 
he makes you want to slay. And <laughs> it's you just got to watch him. Take my word for it. But he talked about how um, that that creative inversion of Doom of Hell is Afraid of You, and for Eternal, I watched some interviews he did with um, the guy from No Clip. I can't think of uh, Danny O'Dwyer. That's his name. And he talked a little bit about how they wanted to make thinking about Doom that he thought made it not as fun as it could have been is that you could basically play through the whole thing with a super shotgun and glory kills. And a lot of people found that boring because the game didn't push them to engage with what made Doom fun, which is the weapon swapping and the, and the mobility and stuff like that. So one of the big goals they had with Eternal is to make combat puzzles, it's a word that he uses, that actually incentivize you to actually ping back and forth between weapons and engage with the environment and all the stuff that will make Doom fun for someone. Um, and he said, he promises that you're going to find it harder and you're going to die. Um, but I'm really curious to see how that actually plays out with uh, with games media because my impression is most people don't want a hard game. Um if you're a Dark Souls, maybe are. you can get away with it because it's an entirely new thing. But if you if you beat Doom and you can't beat Doom Eternal, how are you going to like it? Well, most people suck because hard games are the best. Yes, I that as my playthrough of Doom, just the, the more power you get, that's true. The super shotgun just becomes the solve all problems gun, <clears throat> especially when you get the uh, upgrade on it that lets you fire it twice without before having to reload. Because then you just annihilate too. everything in your way. Yeah. So. I mean, really, all I need to win every fight is the super shotgun and then the uh, shockwave on the pulse rifle that just mm-hmm. kills everything around me. So I'm glad to hear that. Does it? Do they mean that like certain enemies are weaker against certain guns and stronger against certain guns? So you have to change it up depending on which enemy you're fighting? My impression is that there there is some rock, paper, scissors stuff, but it's not strongly enemy typed. Um, what they he did showcase a little bit of and what I saw was enemies are going to have weak spots like lo- like locational damage or when you when you hit those certain weak spots your behavior is going to change like um you could like say blind a caca demon which is the floating guy who shoots the the orbs or um i can't remember what the other ones were oh um the um the the spider guy the brain monster um mm-hmm. y- you're going to be able to disable the gun on top of it uh hmm. the turret um so, so they're trying to they're trying to layer on some stuff to be like it it's to make it mindful killing instead of brainless killing, which a lot of people a lot of people did with Doom that in his mind made them not enjoy it the way that they could have. Yeah, that sounds great. That makes me look forward to it even more. Yeah, me too. I feel the same. But I worry about Dean Takahashi. And his, <laughs> and his family. I mean, I don't know how he's going to be able to, to, to handle Well, that's that. what that easy mode is for. <laughs> yeah, and Doom is one of the games out there that has a lot of... Um, there are like five or six different difficulty modes, right? There's a few. I think you unlock more after you beat a few. But the other thing about Doom, though, is it just... The fucking glory kills just make you... The glory kills combined with the narrative that Hell is Afraid of You... You know, it's the most common trope of describing a game, but it just makes it's you feel like pure. a big old badass. It's pure as fuck, dude. Absolutely. Right. Well, and also just the 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 mechanics that I thought worked really well in the first one, the glory kills keep you moving because you yeah. have to constantly get health from the enemies that have been staggered. And then when you run out of ammo from killing all these enemies, you just bust out the chainsaw and take out the biggest guy in the room in one hit. And then you get all your ammo back to continue killing everyone else again. And so it just greatly encouraged always shooting and always being in motion. Yeah, moving and staying close as opposed to creating distance, um, which a lot of more tactical shooters kind of tend to do, like the counter strikes, you want to create distance, things like that. You're trying to go, go for angles where this, they want you to, it's push forward gameplay. It's what they want to draw out of you. It kind of reminds me a little bit of what they did with with uh, Instagib and Diabotical with yeah. uh, the kill confirm coin mechanic. It's like, yeah, if you kill this guy from 100 meters away, great job, but you're not going to get credit for it unless you close the distance. Yeah. It, it encourages... Anything that encourages movement is great. Yeah. It's I always good. had a term. Uh, do you guys ever play? And this is, we won't go off on a tangent of TFC, but there was a guy named Paragon who I always had to play defense against. And his whole strategy was just stay as far away as possible and shoot you a little bit down 
over a period of minutes until you were dead and then go through. And it was the <laughs> most annoying fucking shit in the world to play against. I hated it so much. It's like dudes who, mul- who mulch and just pull out the shotgun right from the gate. Right. So yeah, yeah. anything that's in your face. But I, what I, the only th- I don't like the design changes to the Doom Slayer so far. It doesn't make any sense to me. It's cool that he has biceps that are four times the size of my face, but it doesn't seem like they should be visible because that doesn't make any sense. But whatever. It's a game where you're killing demons. So <laughs> but that, nothing has to make sense. Disbelief, though. Right. So, yeah, one of the other things about Doom Eternal that really poked out at me <clears throat> watching the, the gameplay is they've really softened the Doom aesthetic a lot, um, which I know... Taylor, I was talking to you about this when we were, I think we were watching Matt stream it a few days ago or whatever. And Doom is, is the, the aesthetic of Doom is extremely homogenous in Doom 2016. There's red Mars and there's a little bit of like, like kind of space age, like industrial, whatever stuff. But there's always the red Mars is kind of the background of Doom. But in this, one of the things that Hugo actually said in the interview that I watched is, they want to bring in more biomes, make Doom more colorful. Do you guys think Doom should be more colorful? No. Given the red well, is like it's such a creative direction of it, right? Like it has. You to don't see it. many red games. So that is nice, but I will say that I remember when you start the level where you're on a cold, snowy part of Mars. That felt like a really nice visual break from all the red in the game. Sure. Yeah. So just given how beautiful everything in id Tech 5 could look, I'm, I don't think I'll have a complaint about it. It'll probably be nice. But plus, you're not on Mars anymore. You're on Earth in this one. Yeah. yeah. And the Fortress of Doom. Have you guys read about the Fortress? No. Is that heaven? Do you guys do any research? <laughs> the, fortress, <laughs> the Fortress of Doom is the, the hub mechanic of, of Doom Eternal. So rather than being a linear game where you play through a progression of levels... Um, it's going to be a hub and spoke uh, arrangement where you have the Fortress of Doom, which is your space station in space, and you're going to use that to warp to different locations on Earth, I think, with different biomes. And whenever you do stuff, when you unlock stuff, you're going to essentially build up your fortress and gain access to, I don't know, fucking ping pong or whatever the fuck else a Doom guy needs in a fortress. Um, that's So it's like Mega Man, basically. I don't know what that means, but you means what I pick, said. you go fight a boss and you get their powers when you defeat them and you take that to defeat another boss. Is that basically what you just said? <clears throat> I don't know You're about going getting in certain powers. Areas. I think actually a lot of what you unlock is more like cosmetics and fun little perks and narrative drops. And um, that's the impression that I get is as exploring the fortress is less about progressing your, your gameplay power and more about kind of exploring... The well, I mean, power in terms of new weapons. Yeah, I don't know about that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure other than weapon progression in Doom 2016, you just get, pick them up as you go, and then you use the little customization robots to unlock new powers, right? Yeah. I don't know. I haven't seen anything about that. I just know that the fortress is going to be the central hub. It's going to be your house, your Doom house. And when you kill demons, <laughs> you're going to get a new fucking tablecloth for your Doom house. That's what I know. <laughs> oh boy. I don't know what to think about that. That does sound very out of place, but given how well they did with the first book, the 2016 one, fuck you, Matt, then I'm sure they'll do great with this one. Maybe they'll so. add microtransactions and loot boxes too. Oh boy. <laughs> I think they make that, they have that Quake Champions animation, just rip it right out. Yeah. Dudes, how cool would it be if Doom, is there going to, is there a place for multiplayer in a game like Doom? I think isn't the original dooms kind of where deathmatch multiplayer came from well quake i think really blew it up but dooms always had a multiplayer legacy doom 2016 had multiplayer but i don't think anyone actually played it well it was outsourced by a different company and it was responsible for all of the mediocre reviews the game got because it was so it was like a loadout system yeah right everyone played the multiplayer and they were like oh god this is going to be terrible and then the review embargo lifted and they got the single player and they were like, oh, shit. Um, yeah. But I, I don't know. I can't remember. I think the only multiplayer element of this is going to be that you show up in other people's games, single player games as demons. I don't know oh, if there's a deathmatch element. Yeah, that's yeah. what I read as well. Oh, wait. 
I just remembered something. They are pimping a multiplayer mode that's an asymmetrical mode where someone is the Doom Slayer and someone else controls a hyper powerful demon. Um, this is actually that's old a mode news. they already had in the other one. Oh, was it? I don't know. Maybe I right. But what's what, the difference this time is it's more like Dark Souls, I guess, where people show up in your campaign as demons. It's kind of cool. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I hope there's still deathmatch or something because I don't. I don't you know care what? about that shit. For my money, new color scheme, new customizations. As long as it has a good story, I'm fine. It looks yeah. narrative. Nobody laughed. Looks more fun to me. Nobody laughed when I said as long as it has a good story. <laughs> I <laughs> come on, guys. You just have actually, to remind us. I actually did like this. I actually had a surprising amount of enjoyment out of the story from Doom 2016. Unlike you, Matt, I cranked down the difficulty on that game because I just decided I didn't need to be good at it to like it. Yeah, you just needed to just relax, right? Relax with some Doom. <sighs> yeah, it's weird. Unlike you, did you ever actually finish it? Uh, no, I'm not done with it yet. How far did you get on Nightmare? Uh, Whenever I lost, I literally can't remember the name of it. No, I'm in hell right now, but I don't remember. It's like Last still on the first level of hell? No, yeah. it's like the second part of hell. Are you going to try to finish it before Eternal comes out? I don't think I'll get a chance before I move. I wanted yeah. to, but probably not. Sure. Plus, I'm probably not going to play Eternal switch? right away. Like, I still have so many other games that I need to play first. So Sure. Yeah, I still have to play Disco Elysium. I don't know when I'm going to get to it. Outer Wilds okay. is the game I'm pumped to play. I think I'm going to buy that. Um, I've heard a lot of good things about that. That looks so fun, and it, it's a good like chill out game too. Which, because so much of what I do is like shooting people, <laughs> it's good to chill out for once in a while. <laughs> yeah, okay. I've always noticed. That's what I was trying to do. That thing with you uh, last year, where we just get to you to play games that you think you'll hate, because yeah. it seems like you have a very specific genre of games that you stick to, and that's about it. Well, <clears throat> it's a moving target for me, but probably the most concise way I can explain it would be to say that I have my inclinations about game mechanics that I like, which we've talked about, you know, fast movement, action, uh, first to third person. Um, and I like RPG progression mechanics. But uh, for me, the ability to make turn a game into something social is really important. So I actually have a hard time engaging with a lot of single player games. Remember back in January when you guys were talking about Black Mesa? Yeah, and uh, mm -hmm. I really hemmed and hawed about it, in even installing that game because I'm like, oh man, not only is this a single player game, it's a single player game that I've beaten before, and not only is it a single player game that I've beaten before, it's a single player game that I've beaten before. I didn't particularly like at the time, but you guys played it, and being able to jump into that conversation was what made it fun to me. Um, still haven't beaten it for the record, but <laughs> uh, did you make it to Zen yet? No, dude, Zen's like the best part of it. Zen's like. Oh, I, I played I watched, through that game uh, again just to get to Zen. I watched Matt play it. So good. It looks pretty cool. I mean, yeah, it was amazing. What did you think of the was final it? boss fight, Matt? Uh, I thought it was like a good skin of the original. The big thought, baby. It was challenging. Knocked it out of the fucking park. Yeah. Com especially compared to what it was originally. Yeah, it was a really good game from start to finish. I feel like it, it's like. It, I think when we first talked about this, I compared it a lot to Link's Awakening, where you know how when you like replay a game that was in your memory and you have this sort of like memory that's more positive of it if you play it. I'm totally misexplaining this. Let me start over. So you have a memory of a game that you really enjoyed when you were younger, and then you go and replay that game and it sucks ass, right? Because <laughs> it's like just modern games have not like it, it, modern games are just so much different now. So like your memory is better. Like Black Mesa and Link's Awakening the remakes were both in, they sort of like played like I remember it rather mm. than like playing like an entirely different game. Like playing like they caught up to modern games. Right, right. It's like playing my memory. Like so those games original. successfully rebottled that feeling that you had all those years ago, as opposed to exactly other times going back where it's just been like, oh, it turns out I don't actually like playing this game from 1995 into 2020. Well, that's, I mean, that's why I have high hopes for Final Fantasy VII's remake, because, like, I played, so I loved Final Fantasy VII when I was, you know, however fucking old I was. I was, like, 10 when it came out. Um, and I tried replaying it, I think, in, like, 2009, when they released it on PS3, 
And it was fucking awful. Like, I just did not like it at all. I was like, this is not what I remember. It's just a horrible game. And I actually do want to download the demo tonight to try it out because I'm pretty excited for it because I'm hoping it kind of recaptures that same feeling. Right. That's that's a game that makes me wish I had a PS4. But at this point, I'm just going to hold out for a PS5. And I think it's going to come to PC anyways. But yeah, I'm so hopeful for that game. I'm kind of bummed that it's going to be, I don't know how many games they're going to make, but it, they're splitting it up into multiple games to tell the whole story. And because of that, they're changing the story a bit, which I, you have to do because you have to catch up to modern gaming. But I oh, just don't fuck it up, Squaresoft. You keep I can't believe that, that game comes out April up. 10th as well, which is fucking crazy. Dude, March and April are nuts. It's going to be a crazy year. Yeah. All sorts of good podcast content. Cyberpunk on the oh, horizon. Yeah, Cyberpunk. That was delayed till September, wasn't it? Yeah, that's delayed. Thank God for that. I got other games to play. Yeah. I think I'm going to go Alex first, then Doom, then Final Fantasy. In that I think the, the thing about Alex is it is going to be an amazing, it's going to be a fucking mind blowing game. And I think it's going to probably catapult VR. But it's probably going to be a game. Well, I don't know because it's. I don't know if it's one of those games where you play it like once and then never again because it. It looks like it has the possibility to be so different every time you play it. I'm just honestly, I'm most excited for the mod, the update to the Source Engine, right? Like the mods that are going to come out of it. Yeah. Yeah, right. they're going to open I'm up curious. VR Half Life for modification. Are people going to be yeah, able to make their own levels and shit? They've they've already said that in an interview that they're adding all components to the source gary's okay. mod vr anyone dude gary's mod vr is gonna be lit hell yeah natural selection i bet would be a great vr port too yeah i mean if if it didn't if they did it right natural yeah. selection is one of those games that back in 2002 really wanted for more modern technology to do what they were trying to do although i haven't well, looked at natural selection too so maybe maybe that's i'm not being fair to myself they did. I mean, I felt like Natural Selection pushed the limits of that engine so much too. Hell like yeah! It was it was a beautiful game. Pigeons just noted in chat that Last of Us Part Two is also in May. Oh, that's right. Which that's another one. I wish I had a PS4 for. Did Where you play that? Time? There, he's no. I started it, which... but so oh, well, why can't, you can't all console Last games be on that. PC? Like this pisses well, me off. I want to play fucking God of War. Because Excellent. that is how they get you to buy the console. Fucking Sony, get with it. My, Microsoft is, is figuring this out, right? Well, that's because Microsoft has Windows. I guess they're competing on different terms. The, I read an interesting uh, article about what Microsoft's new strategy is, where they're doing, they're not putting their games behind an exclusivity barrier, and they're, they're publishing stuff to PC concurrently with Xbox, um, which is that they're not, they don't consider themselves to be competing with Sony and PlayStation, they consider themselves to be com competing against Amazon and Netflix and other major streaming content providers. Hmm. I could see that with Game Pass. Yeah. It's an interesting. Trade. I think, yeah. No, it totally makes sense. I think what they've done with Game Pass is fucking an amazing idea, to be honest. Like, I, I also did the weird thing where you can subscribe to it for a dollar for three years or whatever. So um, I'm a big fan of it. That's what totally a Taylor thing. I don't know why he doesn't use it. I've just never, I've never researched Game Pass at all. What is this thing? I keep reading about certain PlayStation games coming to PC. What? Why do I keep seeing that? Oh, there they're mostly there's on a Epic. leak that is it Horizon Zero Dawn. What was uh, the game that was that was announced recently? It was going to be ported. I can't think of what it was. Death Stranding. Yeah, well, Death, Death Stranding, Stranding was just heard about. To come to PC. Like Kitty Kojima games or Heidi. I don't know how you pronounce this name. Those are always going to come to PC. I think at this point. Yeah, Pigeons past... and Repair are both confirming Horizon Zero Dawn, which is a game that looks pretty cool to play. I think I might give it a shot. So is God of War coming to PlayStation? I mean, to PC? I feel like Anyone I've read something now? about that. Uh, they, nobody's confirmed it from what I've heard. But Pigeons actually made a really good point, too. I think that's the annoying thing that about Sony is that they... It's really not that great of a console. Like the controller sucks, the UI sucks, and its online experience is god awful compared to Xboxes. I mean, sorry, I should say it's better than Nintendo's. Nintendo's is actually the worst of online experiences, but Xbox is like god tier when it comes to online. But they just like nail it with these single player exclusives like all the time. They got uh, Horizon Zero Dawn, they got God of War, they got Spider Man, like all these like single player like 
blockbuster games Sony always fucking gets, and it drives me crazy. That's the only reason I own a PlayStation is for those games. All the entire Yakuza series. I mean, Yakuza comes to PC, doesn't it? No, not that I know of. I know there's some on Steam. I think. Really? Pretty sure. Time to go look. There's Yakuza Kiwami, and that's it. And then they've hinted that it could come to PC, but it never has. I'm looking at Yakuza Kiwami, Yakuza Zero, Yakuza Kiwami Two. Wait, Yakuza Zero's on Steam too? Twenty bucks. Oh, Yakuza Zero is a great game, by the way. Ryan is saying that the Souls games were PlayStation exclusives. Is that true? Yep, that's true too. That's huge. Or was Bloodborne still a PlayStation exclusive? Yep. Hmm. There's. I'm gonna get a PS5 because at this point I'm. I'm too late in the PS4 cycle, and it's going to be backwards compatible with PS4. That is confirmed. That's, that is, is it confirmed? I'm pretty sure it's confirmed. I don't think it's confirmed. I, they've always claimed that, and it never happens. But there's still, there's just lots of, well, all the games I really wanted are coming out soon. But Bloodborne, is, I always wanted, now that I've played Sekiro, I want to try Bloodborne. They should, I feel and, like, um, make PC ports of these games when they announce new consoles. Because that's things being orphaned for pre to previous console generations um really sucks but that's what's Whoa. fucking great about xbox is that they're fully backwards compatible if it's not really the case xbox. anymore either it's because now you have all the virtual stores like on a on a wii u i can go buy however many old snes and whatever games well they, yeah but you have to rebuy them that's the annoying thing so yeah that's what i don't like, like which is why i don't buy them because then they're permanently tied to that console What's great about Xbox is that I've downloaded old saves from like Xbox 360 off of Xbox Live, and my old saves are still there, and I don't have to buy the game again. That's dope. Go, Microsoft. They've nailed it with that shit. Good work, Microsoft, making the best console. It's just you get you don't get the good exclusives, unlike Sony. I still own one Switch game. I, I feel kind of regret for buying that. What game? Mario Odyssey. Well, I own two, but one of them is dumb. Mario Why do you Odyssey. Regret it when you only played one game. <laughs> because there's nothing that makes me want to go buy another game. There's so many good games on Switch. Do you guys have an interest in playing uh, Smash Brothers on Switch? I'll give it a shot. See, I don't really like I, it. I think it's a low tier. So. I would, but I have Smash Brothers on Wii U, and it looks like the exact same damn game to me. Because I have more characters. I have some of my old college. But I have to play the all of them to unlock them. Sorry, Some of my college buddies from the Deep South still play this game. And I used to play Smash, the hell out of Smash Brothers in college and in high school. And I'm thinking about getting it for Switch. And it might be a fun thing for us all to uh, justify our Switch purchases with. I have it already. I haven't really, I played it a little bit. Like they, uh, at my old job, they had a, a lunch crew that would play uh -huh. periodically in our, we had these like, this like, 15 foot tv screen in the lunch area at work and we would play smash brothers tournaments during lunch which was it was kind of entertaining it's a I mean, fun it's social fun. experience yeah it's, it's good do I, do I have to unlock every single character in that game you're asking the wrong guy i don't know i think they're unlocked from the start if i remember correctly because i someone let me borrow it and i started playing it and i could initially select eight characters and that's it and then i would have to play x amount of matches and then i could defeat a character and unlock them and there's like 80 characters in that game and i'm never gonna have enough time to unlock 80 characters that way well if you actually play the game it takes a long time to get good with any character but i think you ryan is saying you unlock it characters by playing it so if you're actually playing it just by playing the game you're gonna unlock stuff like um i've i probably put a couple thousand hours into smash 64 and smash for gamecube whatever that was called melee i think I spent the whole time yeah, playing one character, basically. Um, and it never got boring for me. See, at this, I can just see myself not... I'm not going to put in the time to unlock all of those characters, though. When I beat you, just, just, you will. <laughs> I, I didn't... I did it on Wii U. On Wii U, you start with... Uh, but why do you have to unlock the characters, Taylor? Why does that matter? Why does it matter that I have to do that? Yeah, no, why does it Why does unlocking yeah, the characters don't play the game, matter to you? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> why, not, why not just pick a character, either one of the base unlocks or or one that you want, get them and play them a bunch. Why do you have to have all the unlocks to enjoy the game? Well, I don't. But I'm saying, I don't. Do I get to choose which character I get to unlock next? I don't think that's how it works. I start out with eight. I have the potential of, I'm just throwing out a number, it's seventy to unlock. I don't know which one's going to be next in that. What if there's a character I want to play as, and then he's the seventieth character that I unlock? Then you got to play it and unlock him. 
I don't like that. <laughs> Isn't that the whole point of the game? Is like, why? Did, that's never been the point of Smash you know Brothers, what? though. <laughs> What's the point no of Smash, Smash Brothers? Brothers? Game has done that to fight. Well, we're fighting, so let's play some Smash. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, this is fucking hilarious. Well, I think I think I might buy it as a summer game to kind of chill the fuck I just, out. I don't get why they made that change though, because there's always been unlockable characters, which I think is fine. But to have to unlock that many, I think is weird. Okay, I'm gonna Google this. How many characters? I'm googling it right now, actually. In Smash, the new one's called Ultimate. Or... So you get you get eight yes. of the twelve playable fighters from the original, and then there's 66 that need to be unlocked. Holy and how shit. Many, how many so matches like do you play? Level. You get your first one within 8 to 10 minutes of the game. And then you just do... You ba- you can basically set the rule down to do one minute time limit on it. And that's the fastest way to unlock them if you want. What characters have you liked playing in Smash, Taylor? Pick one. Are you a Link uh, guy? Are you a Mario guy? Are, yeah, but you, you're a Pikachu fuck, aren't you? No, I always like Link. Um, oh, no, you're just... You're me. Shit. <laughs> I'm, I'm a Link yeah, guy, Link's too. Sonic was Link. actually really fun in the uh, Wii U one. Young Link's one of the default characters, so you don't have to wait to unlock him. So what's your gripe about? <laughs> well, I want Wrong to play age. as all of the characters. Ball's too small. That's part of the fun of the game to me when I get it, is to load up all of those characters and see how all of them play. So you're saying you like unlocking characters? <laughs> no, I don't want to spend all of my time unlocking the fucking character. <laughs> They didn't do it in any other Smash games. I don't know why they made the choice for this one to do that. But this goes into why I think I'm not as satisfied with my Switch as you are, is you didn't have a Wii U, and I did. Right. And I've already played Donkey Kong. I've already played Mario Kart 8. I've already played Smash Brothers. I've already played lots of the great games that make buying Wait, what's a Smash Switch Brothers? worth it. Not this Smash Brothers. As Smash Brothers Wii U and Smash Brothers Ultimate look like the same game to me. That's literally every Smash Brothers game is the same game. <laughs> no, Smash Brothers Wii to Smash Brothers Wii U is a huge jump, at least graphically. Yeah, but it's still that's the, the same first game. HD Smash Brothers. That was that's what the appeal of the Wii U to me is. It's the first HD Nintendo console. Everything looks really fucking good. And on the Switch, it doesn't make that big of a jump, and that's the trade-off of being portable, which I, I like that aspect. But there's so many other good games on Switch. I know you have you only have one game, so it's like there's Splatoon 2, there's like the uh Link's Awakening. Um what else is there? Super Mario Maker 2 is great. I'll feel like it's worth it when I get Breath of the Wild 2, because that'll be that'll pay for the console Hell itself, yeah. the amount of time I'll spend ported, on that. They've even ported uh Skyrim. What about uh, Astral Chain? I haven't bought that yet. Did you? How far did you get into it? I got about two hours into it. It's really, it felt really good. But then <laughs> something else, something else <laughs> came out that like took my time away from it, and I can't remember what it was. Like I, I completely switched gears to a different game. And I, Astral Chain is made by the same people who make Bayonetta, and Bayonetta Two is a masterpiece. So I definitely want Bayonetta Three, but because of that. Part of me why don't you just get Astral Chain and then you'll stop hating well, your Switch? Because part of me thinks, why not just wait for Bayonetta 3 instead of getting Astral Chain? Because I but Astral that... Chain is out now. I think it's for Bayonetta 3. Because it's not going to be as good as Bayonetta 3. So How do you I know? Just figure why. Well, because I can, I don't know. It's just what I think. <laughs> why? Why? Well, I don't want to go throw why? out 60 bucks on it, especially when, when you say you made it two hours into the game before you never touched it again. No, it's, no I, I got distracted by uh, Link's Awakening. Are you ever going to pick it up and finish it? Yeah, but I just have a bunch of other shit that I'm playing right now. Actually, right. you know what? I think I'm this gonna isn't do. a resounding endorsement to go convince me to spend no, six dollars on it. Here, here's what I'm going to do because I'm traveling, so I leave this weekend and I'm gone for like weeks, right? And so I'm the only console I'm going to have is the Switch. So maybe I'll just bring it with me and play it on the fucking plane. And Hell then yeah. next time we come back on a podcast, I'll be like, "Guess what I fucking played, you nerd?" Because I was like <laughs> gone for weeks. That's so ginormous Switch reviews. Yes. Yep. What other games should I play during that period? I got to actually confirm with my wife that I can actually take the Switch, though. So that's the only... I will say Tetris 99 was with? an unexpected hit. Uh, with Allison, because she plays the Switch a lot. Oh, okay. I did, the portable aspect of it is great, though. That makes it a great little console. Switch is the best console ever, just for the portability and accessibility. 
They need to fucking figure out what the hell they're doing with the online part of it. It's terrible. Why is, why is it so dumb? Why is the social part of it so weird and obtuse? Why can there, I not play good every game. Super Nintendo and Nintendo game ever created on it? Why can I not? Um, yeah, like Splatoon there... 2 was a fantastic online game, but the playing with your friends on it was fucking abysmal. Has also, there been any new uh, vir SNES Virtual Console games? I haven't seen anything. I don't know. Since they added it. Which also, that itself, that also, I forget about that, but that's another great part of Switch. I like that a lot. What comes after Switch? Switch 2? Is all the shit they're doing on Switch now just going to be gone in Switch 2? Switch U. <laughs> the Switch U. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure it's a winning format. There's no reason to change it that I can see. You just get more processing power in there. It probably came out with some other old. genius thing no one's thought of. Yeah, it's only three years old, so it's That's not their it's thing now. a couple years left. They like to just go be weird. Well, I would think, you know, they have the 3DS technology and VR is becoming a huge thing. I'm willing to bet that the next thing you can like pop into a VR headset so you can they, play it. Nintendo it. did a VR headset, the Virtual Boy. Yeah, uh, old school, baby. <laughs> <laughs> the forgotten yeah. console. They were the OG. I would be surprised to see Nintendo go with VR. It doesn't that really shit's seem... more red than Doom. It doesn't seem like it's 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 in line with the whole toy maker mentality of Nintendo, because VR is well, uh, has a high barrier to entry, um, unless the technology gets to a point where they can sell a simple like couple of two three hundred dollar console that comes with the VR headset, or that is the VR thing. headset. They have their Nintendo Labo thing, and I think one of those is a little cardboard thing that you can pop the console itself into on your face, which that was how. VR with phones started is you just have a little thing that you put on your face and you pop your phone into it. So given that they have the technology of the 3DS, which at this point I think is 10 years old. So I'm sure they've been working on it or improving it or something. Or something. I, I don't know what direction to go in when the market's going to probably head towards VR after Alex. Hopefully. So boys, I think we have one more topic to cover on today's show. What we've all been waiting for. And saving this one up. You guys ready? Yes. We're going to talk about Taylor's great idea for video games. Great ideas for a video game. Taylor? That's that's not what the topic was supposed to be. The topic was just come up with an idea for a game. But it was fine, your, I'll go. It was your suggestion. You're the one so who's did, got great ideas. Did, Let's hear it. I, I'm really smart. Did either of you guys play Sonic Generations? No. no. All right. Well, Sonic Generations is 50% great. And the 50% of it that's great is the part where it's like old Sonic games, where you just play as the fat little pudgy Sonic who doesn't talk or say anything. He's just quiet and adorable and fast. And the levels are all two-dimensional side-scrollers. So I was playing that and having a lot of fun. But as technology has improved, it means we have motion blur. And I found it just makes it harder to tell what's coming up ahead of you. So I thought, and Sonic's been in a lot of trouble for a long time. It's just a stupid fucking franchise because they do all this hip 3D bullshit that sucks. So I always thought if you just make a Sonic game with a time reversal mechanic like uh, Sands of Time, Prince of Persia, that would be really fun where you turn the goal of Sonic into getting from the start of the level to the end of the level as fast as you can in one fluid path rather than being a shitty platformer. I like that idea. You know what it sounds like to me? Because it's a really good mobile game. Yeah, that would be a great mobile game. Maybe. Well, the the friend, my fr the idea my friend and I came up with is Time Tortoise, which the character is like a turtle that's had a jetpack strapped to his back and he can't stop going forward. So you have to, and it's also a time machine. So you reverse time when you crash so that you can figure out how to not crash. But And what's the Time I Tortoise's just, name? Oh, what was it? I don't know. We had a name for him. It was stupid. Rest assured, that was the idea. What's the turtle's motivation? Oh, God. Anyway, so I just... Sonic's all about going fast, and they have these dimensional levels that prevent you from doing that. So I feel like just adding in a time reversal mechanic would really make Sonic a lot more interesting of a game. That's pretty cool, yeah, actually. I can see that. I know I was making fun of you when I, when I suggested this, but that's actually a pretty cool idea. I don't know why two people on a video game podcast who have been playing video games their entire life are so against the idea of coming up with an idea for a fucking game. 
<laughs> I have an idea. Actually, I had this idea years and years ago, and I don't even know if it's ever been done. Do you want to hear it? Is it an insult towards me? It's not a joke. It's it's okay. honest, and it could be dumb. Uh, you guys know F Zero, right? Yeah, yeah. Super fast, twitchy racing game. Um, and I found myself when I when I was playing F Zero sixty four back back in the day. I always when I was playing this game and thinking to myself, how badass would this game be if it was hard enough to ha- to require the really twitchy driving skills, but you also had a dude on a gun turret on your fucking ship. And that's that's the so idea. Good. It's F Zero with with a gunner. So, so planet like combat cars. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> very very fast planet side combat cars, something like that. I always thought that would be, be a fun. really a really fun game to do, like um like a uh uh four player with a, a two sided split screen where you have two players controlling one vehicle, one pilot, one gunner on the left, and same on the right. Um, I always thought that would be a fun game to play. I can't believe that just games like Destruction Derby with the technology we have to power games now haven't made a comeback in any form. Yeah, Destruction Derby was a fucking classic. I mean, that would be, it would be gorgeous. I don't know why it's not a thing now. Yeah. And so, yeah, Twisted Metal also, I don't know why that, I guess the, the, the last one was a few years ago, I guess. I don't know why that's not a huge success now. Or Carmageddon. I never played Carmageddon. Was it the same thing? Similar, yeah. So my game idea, because I'm really horribly un- like not creative at all in this regard, is you get really abstract business requests for data and analysis, <laughs> and then you have to write a <laughs> SQL query for it. So for example, <laughs> can you pr- like do an analysis for why this professional services investment was actually worth our time? And then you have to run a SQL query for that. <laughs> I hate everything that include, about all of those words. Yeah, but are there like like extra bonuses you can get? Like if if you add like like data quality multiple like multipliers, where the quality of the data you have is is garbage, and you have to yeah, work with it, with external stakeholders to clean it up before you can even do. Yeah, how analysis. do you cleanse the data? It sounds yeah. like you should play a game called Papers, Please. No, it'd be on CoolMathGames.com. <laughs> That's <laughs> another. Uh, game idea that just I've never thought past the concept, but it, it came from something we were talking about one night. It would be cool if you played a game where you're a schizophrenic character and it's like a first person shooter of some sorts, I guess. But there's just like you have to figure out what's real and what's not. Like there's mm. there's something guiding you somewhere and you don't know if it's guiding you to your doom or if it's guiding you to kill someone. Just the the problems that a schizophrenic person faces. That would be, think, like stuff just appears and then disappears. I think that'd be cool. Yeah, we have, we have had this conversation before. I think I brought up um, Hellblade as an example of a game that plays with psychosis as a game mechanic. I haven't actually played it. I've only watched coverage of it, but um, I think it plays with that idea a little bit. Yeah. I always confuse. I always think of Hellgate London when I hear Hellblade. What is Hellblade? It's a game about a psychotic Viking warrior. Um that's kind of all I know about it. It's it's action combat, um, and uh, I think they just actually put a trailer out for the sequel um, to Hellblade, and it has um it's got a song from I'm gonna butcher this pronunciation. I'm positive. This uh, Viking band called Heilung, which is, which yeah, are so incredibly badass. I'll have to look that up. I'll link it to you guys. Um, what kind of game is Hellblade? It's like third person. I think it's a third-person action. action game. Those are fun. I think. Yeah, yeah. There's some light puzzling. Interesting. Yeah, I've never even heard of it. Oh, you, you know, know I, I remember want? why I know that. Because the developer also made a game called Heavenly Sword. So they have Hellblade and then Heavenly Sword, I think. That's yeah. a fun anecdote. Go on with whatever you were going to talk about. <laughs> so on the subject of SQL query-based games... Um, no, just kidding. I... <laughs> I really want a strong single player campaign focused game. Actually, I I've already misrepresented it. I want a strong campaign based shooter that is made for co-op. That's what I want. Like Borderlands? Right, but I wouldn't say that's strong. Not, not <laughs> Borderlands is a game that can that works for co-op. 
right? You can play it solo. You can play a co-op. But it doesn't have mechanics in it that require or specifically are made for co-op. I want a cooperative campaign shooter experience That's... where you have to actually cooperate with each other, where there's dependencies built in. I mean, I guess you can call Borderlands that, but Borderlands is more of like a carrot. Like, I think you can have synergistic builds, but the game doesn't push you to do it. I want a game that actually pushes cooperative stuff. Mm. See, I don't know if that's good or bad, because when I hear that, the first game I think of is Resident Evil 5, which is basically a single-player game. It's a co-op game. I don't know. It's It works really well in co-op, but in single-player, it's kind of a lot dumber because you're stuck with an ai partner who can't figure out how to do shit so i don't know i guess if if single player is out of the equation then whatever could be ryan really is saying that kane and lynch was the kind of game that i'm looking for i'm gonna watch a i'm gonna have to look at that and see what that's about what about far cry 5 single player, i always right? thought far cry 1 as co-op would be incredibly fun because you're just on these giant open islands and you could attack from multiple sides and kill everyone I want to play through Doom co-op or I want some of these MMOs that are out that have story in them to actually have fun multi like like cooperative story content you can do together. Um you just want to socially experience all of these single player games you're missing out on. Is that what's happening? Yes. Yes. Like I want to play Black Mesa with you guys. I want to play Doom with you guys. Um it's we fun should, uh... to play by myself and talk to you about it, but I really just want to be in there with you. Have you guys played Hunt yet? No, I know not. of it. That's a it's a great co op game. Yeah, but it's Greg not spoke with disdain. It looks fun. It's not it's not a story focused campaign though. No, not at all. Yeah, it's a a multiplayer repetitive thing. Yeah, I'd be happy to play Dishonor with you, but I don't know how that could possibly be a kind of campaign. Yeah, I mean co op, not campaign. Anyway. I guess we just got to play Dungeons and Dragons, guys. Yep. <laughs> yep. Well, my right, wizard guys. fucks your mom. I promised you guys we wouldn't run too long, but we've been here for two hours. So, sorry, not sorry. Anything We're else you guys want to talk about before we wrap? Indeed. I would uh, like to thank a concurrent 10 people watching our podcast. 11 now. Ooh. Yeah, thanks all for turning yeah. out. Um, this is Deeg here with who again? Outro yourself, guys. My name is Matt. Thank you. Hi, I'm Taylor. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Taylor. <laughs> Bye, Matt. Bye, Twitch. Thanks all. This is Basement Side. Follow the stream if you want to see us again, or don't if you don't. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.